Hey everybody, I'm checking to make sure I can hook up everything right now. It's asking me to download something again, like it hasn't done it 20 times. Let's see if it works. Yes. So it is working. I can just stop share now. And I can admit all. <clears throat> Evidently, I've been recording all that, but I didn't mean to, but now I've got this. So anyways, anyone have any questions before we get started? And I'll explain whatever, what happened in the past couple of days other than that email I sent you that helps you understand. Anybody have any questions on anything? Uh, yeah, I just want to ask a question. So the, when the email got sent out that the class was canceled Monday, I didn't show up to lab and they docked my grade for that. So I don't oh, know. Geez. Um, I don't know if you could account for that somehow, please. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll fix that. All right, thank uh, you. You've got Miss Raskovic, right? Yeah, I emailed her, but I didn't get the email till like the next day. So yeah, she uh, she probably didn't know what was happening. I'll speak with her about it. Who is this I'm speaking with? Michael. Michael, anybody else have a similar problem? No, that's good. What's your last name, Mike? Oh, hold on a second. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, I, I, I screwed up. I recorded the wrong date for a training session for, you know, FERPA and HIPAA and all that good stuff. And, of course, I missed it. And literally, I was in the process of re-downloading all my Microsoft stuff. So I've been without everything Microsoft, as well as my TCC, as well as SIS, uh, since late Friday night or early Saturday morning. So I apologize for that. We had to cancel a couple of things, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm not too terribly worried about it. We might have to cut some stuff out of the end of the semester, which is some of the uh, modern physics stuff, which I really don't want to cut out, but I, I might have to. Uh, I'm also considering, instead of taking up any of your lecture or lab time, which obviously lecture time is not possible, I'm thinking about just doing a uh, the test with Respondus. But uh, I would need to know, do any of you not have a uh, camera? If you all have a camera, I can do a Respondus test, and then I won't have to take up any lab time for you to take the, the midterm or the final. Uh I've been using a military training officer for all my exams through TCC. Is is that okay? Yeah, that would probably be acceptable as well. You still have to have a respondent's lockdown browser just to, in case, you know, they walk around or whatever. You're not allowed to you know, search the internet, but you wouldn't need the camera part. That would be fine. Okay. So, uh, anybody else? Did, does anybody else not have a camera? Okay. That's cool. Yes, yeah, so we might do that. Uh, my, the midterm is supposed to be a week from today. Um, I thought about pushing it back since we missed two days. I mean, but the problem is we've already covered the chapters that are on it, so it's not really harming us that way. Uh, the major harm was in the ability, my inability to get the practice midterm up until today. I got it up first thing this morning. So you do have a practice midterm that you can start on. Uh, so I'm going to think about it. if y'all want to give me your own opinions, you can email me and let me know. But uh, I, I'm really trying to figure out whether I should drop, I mean, uh, move it from Wednesday to Monday or just keep it on, on Wednesday. So if y'all have any preferences, you know, now would be a good time to let me know. And I might be able to do it. It's just like I said, I, I don't know that we need to, but at the same time, it might be something that y'all would appreciate. Is the, um, the midterm, is it going to be like the respondus has to be done during our class time or can uh, that be flexible? Yeah, it, it should be done all at the same time. If you ha can't take it at that time, I'll make up a separate test for you or whoever. Uh, just because, you know, obviously if one person took it at the regular time, someone else took it later, that second person might have the advantage of hearing about what was on it. Uh, not oh, necessarily okay. I was the one that talked to you previously like I would need to take it like 15 minutes after oh. like class starts right yeah that wouldn't be a problem at all now okay yeah I usually allow my students to start uh up to 45 minutes early and up to 45 minutes late really because there's no way they can finish in that time all right so the last time we met I had talked to you about 
Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I just, um, how much time do we have available for the midterm? Uh, I put on there, I think I did 75 minutes, so like an hour and 15 minutes. How many questions are on it? Uh, I think 20, 25, something like that. A lot of them are supposed to be, you know, chucker questions that are really easy, but there's a couple that are, you know, supposed to take a little while. Okay. If you had, if anybody has accommodations, by the way, you got to make sure you let me know so I can adjust it for you guys. Uh, might even be if y'all need to take it at the testing center, we have testing center facilities. I can get that set up there. Uh, I, I think most people are cool with it if they take it via Respondus with the lockdown browser and the camera. So just let me know. I know I have one student here who's, who would get it done by one of his uh, officers or something. So that might work. I'm um, looking at a, a text message or chat someone sent me. So, okay. Yeah, so I have a, a, at least one vote on on pushing it to Monday. Did, does anybody else feel compelled to, that that would help them a, a good deal? Yeah, I would be compelled if you push it to Monday because I haven't really, I haven't really like uh, studied for it a lot because I've been focusing on chapter seven and eight homework because gotcha. that chapter seven is due Sunday. So it would be best if you pushed it to in, in Monday. I'll do it to Monday. Chapter. It's no problem. Just to confirm that that is this Monday coming up, correct? No, no, it's next Monday. It's like the 25th, I think, 24th. Is that, is that posted on Canvas yet? Uh, no, not the midterm, but the practice midterm is. All right, unless you're asking about practice, uh, the new date, put it on Canvas. I didn't put that on Canvas yet. But yeah, we'll go ahead and move it back to the 20. It's actually the 24th if I'm looking at the months correctly here. Yeah, Monday the 24th. So we'll put the uh, practice right test. Can we do multiple midterm practice tests or is it just one? Uh, it's multiple, just like the other tests. So each time you take it, okay. it'll be a different set of questions. Okay, thank you. No problem. And by the way, uh, I reserve the right to make 80% of the points on your midterm entirely different questions from the ones you had access to on the actual practice test. I haven't done that literally in four years. So, <laughs> so and you're literally getting a taste of every possible question that could come up there. So the more diligent you are about working those and figuring out how to solve them, the better chance you have of making a really good score on the face-to-face -face midterm, which again, it's not really face-to-face -face if we're doing it with Respondus, but it sort of is. With Respondus, it has a lockdown browser that keeps you from searching the web. And it's got a camera where they watch you uh, they have random shifts, people in other countries and stuff they pay to, to, to monitor your uh, behavior. And they look for odd behavior, like somebody constantly doing this, they're going to call that odd behavior if you've got your stuff under the actual table. Whereas if you've got your camera pointed down where you can see your desktop and you're only focusing on your desktop, they're not going to uh, flag that. And then what they do is they flag anything that looks suspicious to them. And then I'm uh, required to go in and uh, release the grade to see if that's really it. So you you can't leave the room. You, you have to start. Uh, you can't have anything within lungeable distance uh, that can access the internet. You can't have any notebooks or textbooks within lungeable distance. You got to take your camera and aim it downward so you can see your workspace and see you know under your desk and all that. And we you got to show us your uh, equation sheet front and back slowly. You got to hold up an ID next to your face so we can compare your face to the ID. If it's, if it's a you know an ID with an important number like your driver's license number, you can feel free to cover up that number. The main thing is we need to see the name and the face that goes with it, not not the number. Uh, so that that's the that's the big part with it, and it's not too hard. But I do put up a practice one. There'll be a practice uh, midterm that says respond us on it. And that you don't, that one's not going to be graded at all. It will be graded, I mean, but it's not going to ever count towards your grade, like in the practice test, extra credit stuff I give you. It's just purely for you to make sure your browser that you use on whatever computer you're using is capable of running Respondus lockdown browser and capable of running the camera. So we can't use our notes at all on the midterm? You're allowed an equation sheet, but that's it. Okay. And the equation sheet, by the way, can't have any of the constants and any of the uh, any of the derivatives and integrals that are in the front and back covers of your textbook. Those are all allowed. The equations that are allowed are only the ones that are numbered 
uh, you know, in the textbook, you'll see it'll have an equation and there'll be a little parenthesis and it'll say 1.24 or something like that. Uh, those are allowed, but not any other ones. Any other questions? Wait, the ones in the textbook, which? Yes. One? Yeah, let me show you. I'm going to do this. Is it annotated somewhere over what's allowed so we can refer back to it when we're making our cheat sheet or like our? Yeah, you, what you're going to do is you're going to go through the, the chapters and notice this equation has 8-1. That's one you can use. That one above it doesn't have a number, so you can't use that one. So that's basically it. As the as I teach, I sometimes like tonight I'm going to introduce a new equation. So that one you can write down and put it on your equation sheet, even though you won't find it in the book at all, much less in the book with a with a number next to it. So that's what I mean. And you guys know you can access your textbook by uh well, let me show you this again. So this um, we can't if we're using respondus. Uh, right. Yeah. You're not. No, that's what I'm saying. You've got to make an, a, an equation sheet. So what I was saying was on your my lab and mastering, when you're over here, you click on this button, my lab and mastering. And out will pop a window that looks like this. And then you click Pearson eText. That's where your textbook is in case you hadn't found that yet. I think everybody's probably found it by now. I hope so. So, but anyways, this is the e-text and only the equations with these numbers right here beside it can be used. Does everybody, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on this chapter eight. Uh, really chapter eight, I can pretty much do it with one or two major examples. And uh, what's going on here is, we learn in, in kinematics, you learn about one dimensional motion, and that's just motion without really thinking about what causes the motion, you know, what makes something have an, a velocity, what makes something uh, have an acceleration, what makes something accelerate up to some velocity, and then what makes something accelerate back down to zero, that sort of stuff. That's the dynamics portion, but the portion of if an object has this velocity and this acceleration, how far will it go? How fast will it be going sometime later? All that stuff, that's just kinematics, okay? The idea of acting of acting like trying to figure out how that motion became what it was, that's the dynamics portion. And when we first started that, that was with Newton's laws of motion, which were inherently vector equations, okay? Now, we didn't really have a definition of vectors back then. Uh, that was all developed in the 1850-ish era but they didn't have it at that time, but they very well knew what they were dealing with. And if you read the Pincipia, you'll see he does all that with geometry and stuff like that. A lot of it he does just with geometric proofs. But the main thing is uh, you have to use vectors to implement Newton's laws of motion, essentially, okay? Now, what we're gonna teach you here with the work and energy process that we learned last time and now with conservation of energy is, as I told you before, a way to do physics uh, with scalars. Okay, that's that's a big important thing. That's what we're really shooting for here. And that doesn't mean you throw away Newton's second laws. My daughter was just asking me about this the other day. Uh, she was doing uh, a conservation of energy problem and uh, part of the energy loss was due to friction and she had to use Newton's second law for Y motion to figure out what the normal force was. You know, you can't just use normal forces equal to mg uh, because sometimes the uh, mass is on an inclined plane, in which, which case the normal force turns out usually to be mg cosine theta. Uh, and it can also be increased if, for instance, you're applying a force that has a component parallel to the surface, uh, to the normal vector. So all that stuff can play in it. So you can't just randomly uh, throw away Newton's laws of motion and vectors in general, but you can still get a lot of stuff without having to mess with vectors. And that's what all this is about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a few quantities. Uh, what I like to picture the conservation of energy is, uh, conservation of energy being about, is sort of like a giant Ziploc bag. So you have this really wonderfully, you know, blue and yellow make green seal so that you know it's 100% uh, airtight. You pinch it off real good. It makes a nice green seal. And then you have inside of that big freezer bag, you have a baffle that says potential energy. 
And then you have another baffle that's again inside of that. And it says kinetic energy. And you have another baffle that says uh, chemical energy and another baffle that says radiative energy and all this stuff. There's all the, all the different types of energy you can imagine uh, that you can, you can extract from anything. Okay. Now, most of the time we just talk about mechanical energy. It's just going to be a potential energy and a kinetic energy. And that's what your book is talking about a little bit. It'll just say, uh, delta U, which is a symbol we use for potential energy, plus delta K, which is a symbol we use for kinetic uh, for kinetic energy. Uh, he'll say delta U plus delta K is equal to zero. That's my least favorite version of conservation of energy, just because you've got to be a little bit meticulous about signs and make sure you remember delta is always final minus initial and all that good stuff. And then when you take into account gravitational acceleration, or excuse me, gravitational potential for distances from the Earth that are way bigger than the Earth's radius, there's an inherent negative in there that makes things get squishy and, and con, uh, a little concerning. Not only that, if you want to add in, you know, energy loss due to friction or work put in due to someone working on it, stuff like that, it's not obvious where, where those terms go in the delta K plus delta U equals zero scenario. So that's my least favorite version. Uh, one part your book does is it says U initial plus K initial equals U final plus K final. That's definitely a step up. And the reason why I say it is, is because all those terms essentially, other than using that gravitational one I told you about a second ago, where the distances are way farther than the center of the earth to the edge of the earth, uh, those signs get a little hairy. But other than that, the signs are all positive. It works well. You can sort of figure out where you want to put in work in or work out or energy loss due to friction. Uh, all that kind of stuff. So all that's uh, pretty good. But still what I found is I found a version that's not going to be in your book at all, but it's a version of conservation energy that, that I like to use. So I'm going to give you that. But first, I got to talk to you about what is potential energy and what is kinetic energy or oomph as Madame de Chatelet called it. So Madame de Chatelet, by the way, uh, was this brilliant young lady uh, who was the first person to translate Newton's Principia from Latin to a language of the Vulgate, which would have been French in her time. Uh, she actually translated it to French. Uh, she was a, not only was she brilliant, uh, she was a, quite a powerful personality. I think she did that translation, I want to say at the age of 16. Uh, and not only that, like Voltaire was like her boy toy, if that gives, <laughs> gives you any idea of how much of a, a brilliant person she was. Can you imagine Voltaire is often thought of as one of the most intelligent writers uh, that we've ever had. Uh, he sort of walked around like a little puppy behind her. And she was married, of course. She had a, 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 a rather respected nobility type person that was her husband. Uh, but she ended up dying at a very young age from childbirth. But yeah, she literally uh, translated the Principia to French and she came up with the concept of kinetic energy and she called it oomph. <laughs> so I kind of like that. But anyways, we're going to learn what that what that kinetic energy is. And we're going to learn what that potential energy is. And what I'll tell you is potential energy is normally a phrase we use for energies that are related to a position uh, of some object in, in somewhere in space or at least a position relative to something else. So, for instance, there's a potential energy. And I try to think of energy as uh, anything that has the ability to do work. And then I try to think of work as anything that could drive a nail, okay? Now, the, the caveat to that is the nail can be infinitely sharp. <laughs> it can be one, an, uh, one atom or even one proton in diameter. So it can be really, really thin and doesn't take a lot of force. And it can be pushed into something as easy as, say, pudding. And I'm talking like American pudding, like banana pudding or, or vanilla pudding or something, not, not, not like a bread. OK, so if you can imagine something that applies a force over a distance, that is work. And energy is anything that has the ability or provides the ability to do work. And work, like I said, is anything that can actually drive a nail. And again, you got to consider options like nails that are perfectly sharp and really, really thin and going into very, very soft things. OK, once you get there, then you can sort of make sense of it. So potential energy is called potential because, for instance, let's imagine one scenario, Mr. Younger standing on a sidewalk, uh, let's say, wanting to push a nail into the into the dirt. OK, I just take my foot, I lift it off the 
sidewalk and I push it down on the nail and it drives a nail into the ground, okay? That's clearly a type of energy and the energy I had when it was up above, let's say this is the ground and this is the concrete and the nails right here, that energy that I had was due to the potential I had to do work on the nail. And it was because I was up here. Now, if you take me and stick me on top of a fence post, then I have even more potential energy because I can actually jump down as opposed to just stepping down. And I can come down with the full body weight instead of just the strength of my legs versus the weight of my body. And I can actually uh, gain a little bit of velocity and use that momentum to push it in. Again, using momentum here just as a everyday word. Uh, next chapter, we'll start to get into actually defining what momentum is. And so that's what I mean by potential energy. It's the potential to do work, and it's usually a result of position. So uh, another one that, that you can think of as potential energy is how far away an electron is from the nucleus of the atom. Uh, you know the nucleus of the atom, uh, no matter what atom it is, if you happen to separate one electron from it, not even physically, just, just think about it separate from the rest of it, then that electron sees a net positive charge associated with the rest of the atom, and that electron's negative is being attracted in there. The potential it has to speed up, slow down, or drive a microscopic nail, for instance, is directly related to how far it is from all those charges or most specifically to the center of the nucleus of the atom. Uh, similarly, a molecule is made up of a bunch of atoms and the potential of one of those atoms relative to the whole molecule, the potential energy is related to the distance between that particular atom from that whole molecule. For instance, in the case of water, which is like a Mickey Mouse, you got a big oxygen molecule that's sort of spherical and you got two smaller hydrogen molecules that are sort of spherical, like Mickey Mouse ears, and the relative position of the, of the Mickey Mouse ears slash hydrogen molecule or atoms uh, relative to the position of the oxygen atom gives it a potential energy, okay? And then finally, if you think of not just a spring, but if you think of any physical rod or something like that, Hooke's Law applies, and Hooke's Law says that basically... If you compress, if you push a force on an object downward to try to compress it, or if you put a force upward on an object that tries to stretch it, the object within an elastic limit will re reciprocate with that by supplying a force that's proportional to the amount it stretches. So if I'm pulling on this really, really hard, I might get a whole millimeter stretch, even though this is really just foam, just foam. But you can imagine it's going to be the case with steel. It's going to be the case with aluminum. And obviously, they're going to move a different amount based on whether it's steel or aluminum. But in general, what it means is the larger force I put on this, the more it's going to compress. And that force, in fact, is going to be from the metal in the opposite direction of the force you, you apply to it. Okay. Well, that's good and that works, but we don't work much with that in labs because this takes literally hundreds of thousands of pounds to compress a piece of steel, right? So what we tend to do is we work with a little bit simpler piece of metal uh, coiled up in a spring. So you take a spring and wrap it around and around and around. That's made of some steel and it's got some equilibrium position where if you just hang it from something, it's going to reach some equilibrium position where it's not compelled to stretch anymore. Or if you lay it sideways, it'll reach some uh, equilibrium position where it's not compelled to move left or right. The main thing is there's some distance in both of those scenarios, uh, two different distances where that spring is at equilibrium. If, on the other hand, you're hanging that spring and you put a mass on it, gravity is going to pull on that mass with a force W equals mg. That's going to tend to stretch that spring. And what Hooke's Law says is that the force that that spring applies to that mass will be equal to negative k times x. So you're going on the assumption that the equilibrium position of the spring is at the origin of the x-axis and that the x-axis, say, positively points down. So if you stretch it positive one centimeter or 0.01 meters, 
then 0 0.01 times some K times a negative number is the direction and magnitude of the force the spring's going to apply to it. If you, on the other hand, stretch it two centimeters, there's going to be negative K, that constant that I haven't told you about, times 0 0.02, and you're going to get twice as big a force. Additionally, if you push up on it, then the X is going to be negative, and that negative with the negative out front is going to make it positive, and that's exactly the way that force would push, because when you compress it, the spring's going to try to push it back down. So that's uh, four different examples of something that could make potential energy. Other than that, there's, and there's actually plenty more, okay, there's also kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. Kinesis uh, is a word for motion. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and uh, we will derive the work energy theorem, and that should actually, and actually, I think I did do that last time already in chapter seven. Didn't I do that, guys? Yeah, I recall. Actually, I'm in my tooth. Anybody remember whether I derived the work energy theorem? All right, looks like no one remembers or everybody's left me. I don't know which whichever it is. Okay, <laughs> I can pull up my old notes and check real quick though. Let me do that. Oh yeah, I don't think I did that. Let me see. Oh yeah, yeah, I did do that. The work energy theorem was the next to the last page of my notes from our last meeting. Okay. So uh, yeah, the work energy theorem basically allowed us to derive that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So now I'm going to go about uh, working with potential energy and kinetic energy and showing you how to solve these problems. And I'm going to give you a, a big thing that we've discovered that makes, I don't know, working with these non-vector quantities, these energies, uh, really useful. One thing I did notice I didn't do is I didn't go into a lot of detail with discussing to with you what the actual units of these energies were. So I want to uh, catch back up on that. So let's start off by sharing our screen. So I say sharing our screen. In actuality, I say I'm going to catch up by sharing my screen. Okay. Now, what we discovered uh, last time was that uh, the change in potential energy delta U is equal to the negative of the work done by gravity. Okay. So that was equal to the uh, negative integral of F due to gravity dot DL like this. Okay. Now what we imagined in fact was the force due to gravity was F G or excuse me, I should say F big G because I've started using that which we used to call it just plain W, but for this argument, I'm gonna call that M times G. It's a vector, so I'm gonna put a negative in front of it and say it's acting in the K hat direction for a reason you'll see later. But basically what I'm saying is the up axis is now Z and down is negative Z. So the force due to gravity is pushing down. And uh, if I wanna calculate that work, I'm gonna say negative integral from uh, z equals zero to z equals h, say. Actually, no, no, let's just call it z equals uh, z, okay? And what I'm gonna say is the force is negative mg k hat, and then my uh, dl is going to be, I'm choosing, I've already chosen the range of integration to point in the direction that I'm going. I went from Z equals zero to positive Z. So that means my DL just needs to point in the positive Z coordinate direction. So I'll call that plus DZ K hat as well, okay? So remember that's the rule with these line integrals. You choose either the range of integration or the differential uh, line element to point in the direction that you're actually going. The other one just points in the positive coordinate direction. So from this, I get negative times a negative is positive. The mg comes out front. So I get mg times the integral of dz times k hat dot k hat, which we learned before that k hat dot k hat or any dot product is the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between them, which in this case would be zero. 
So this is in fact just equal to one for that dot product. So ultimately I just get M times G times Z. That's my potential energy. So, and this actually only applies as you'll see because the MG, uh, the MG is only 9.8. G is only 9.8, very close to the surface of the earth. If you get much farther away from the surface of the earth on the order of two and three times the radius of the earth away, then that G changes very significantly. So this equation is only valid for Z close to uh, the radius of the planet. So U of Z, for instance, can be written as M times G times Z for Z on the order of radius of the planet which in this case we talk about Earth, but it would be for any planet. So you can do it for the moon, you can do it for the sun, whatever. So that was one of the formulas we found. Another formula we found was the change in potential energy uh, for a spring was in fact equal to uh, the work done in compressing the spring is one way you could look at it, or you could look at it as the work done uh, by the spring, in which case it'd be the negative. So we say the work done by the spring is gonna be negative and then, of course, the force would be negative kx, and that's going to point in the i-hat direction. So that's the direction of the force. I'm going to dot that with dx i-hat, okay? And that's the positive coordinate direction, but I'm going to actually compress it from x equals 0 to x equals, say, uh, now, let's actually stretch it. I'll stretch it from x equals 0 to x equals x. OK? So as I stretch it in the positive x direction, you can see that the f equals negative kx is the actual force uh, force the spring is uh, providing. So it's really the work done, the negative of the work done by the spring. That's what we're talking about here. So this is negative of the work done by the spring. So that's what we mean when we, when we often equate the change in potential energy do, uh, equal to a negative of work. So in this case, it's going to be positive K integral X dx, and then I hat dot I hat, which of course is just one again. And we're going to integrate this from zero to X. And in this case, you get one half K X squared. Okay. So that is the potential energy. So we got another formula, U spring of X is equal to one half K X squared. That K looks really bad. So I'm going to change it. Okay. So there's another potential energy we found. And then we also found that K, the kinetic energy, was equal to one half mv squared. Now, once we get into rotational motion, we'll see that there's a potential, or excuse me, there's kinetic energy associated with, say, a ball moving left, right, up, down, left, right, uh, all that stuff. In fact, there's a, a velocity that's the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus v squ uh, vz squared. So the uh, kinetic energy of the center of mass of the object would just be one half mv squared. But the ball or whatever it is could be rotating as well about one axis, in which case there's another form of kinetic energy. Uh, and that has the form of one half i omega squared, where i is something we call as the moment of inertia. And omega is the rotational angular velocity measured like in radians per second. Uh, so we'll learn that there's other forms of kinetic energy as well, but right now we don't need that, okay? So now that I've got these things that we can work with, I want to express what I call the conservation of energy. But before I do that, I want to address the problem that I uh, neglected to do last time, which was talk to you about what the units of energy are. So the units of potential energy is the same as the units of kinetic energy is the same as the units of work, okay? And it's 
uh, equal to the same as the units of just plain energy, okay? Like E equals MC squared or all that stuff. Those units turn out to be the Newton times a meter, uh, which is defined to be a joule, okay? And one joule is about as much energy as it takes to lift one plump juicy apple I usually think red delicious apple from the floor to the top of a dinner table. Okay. So so that's a real physical meaning of what the uh, what the jewel is. It's literally the amount of energy required to lift a nice, juicy, plump, uh, red, delicious apple from the floor to uh, your your tabletop. Okay, so when you think of things like a hundred watt light bulb, which literally means a hundred joules per second, uh, you start thinking electricity, which is you know when you buy energy. It's actually pretty cheap. You know, it's not un uncommon to see 12 cent per kilowatt hour, uh, which is, you know, a kilowatt hour is on the order of 3.6 million joules. Uh, can you imagine paying somebody 12 cent to lift 1 million red delicious apples uh, or 3.6 million red delicious apples from the ground to the floor uh, to the tabletop? That's yeah. Electricity is actually fairly cheap in, in that perspective. <laughs> OK. All right, so now that I've discussed that, let's go ahead and give you my, my version of conservation of energy. So again, what I wanna show you is what the book has. So uh, your book didn't do this one, but this is a version and it says Delta K plus Delta U is equal to zero. That's for non, or excuse me, that's for only for conservative forces. Actually, I shouldn't put the forces there. So uh, no Democrats. No, that's not it. <laughs> so conservative in this, in this sense means something. Okay. Uh, I will tell you what it means in a second. But right now, that's only for conservative forces. There's another version. And this is the one your book gives you. And it's K initial plus potential energy initial is equal to K final plus potential energy final. And this too is only for conservative forces. And conservative forces are ones where energy is not converted to heat for starters. Okay. Energy is not dissipated. And examples of conservative forces are gravity and the electric force. Okay, non conservative. are friction, air resistance, slash drag, uh, just stuff like that in general. Your book actually gives you a nice little table with several other things, but uh, that's the problem. There are some things that you want to be able to account for. You would like to account, for instance, for how much energy is lost in a car collision due to the car crumbling, right? 
Well, you can't do that with these. And in fact, it's not crystal clear what to do. So what I write as my conservation of energy, and, and this is an equation you are allowed to put on your equation sheet when you do the midterm and final, uh, even though I don't think, uh, I don't think, I can't remember if this even is covered on the midterm, but I'll address that in a second. So actually, no, the midterm is one through six, so it shouldn't be on there. But here's my equation. I say work in plus potential energy initial plus kinetic energy initial is equal to work out plus potential energy final plus kinetic energy final plus E loss. Now, that's actually a little bit arbitrary. You can see, for instance, it's not symmetric. It bothers me that I have a work in on the left hand side, but I don't have another term like the uh, E loss. So uh, let me explain what this is. So what you want to do is you want to look at a physical problem uh, that you wish to solve, and you want to think of all the different ways energy is being uh, transferred from one object to another are literally just stolen from the system. So for instance, if you see a car wreck, let's say a, a car, a guy falls asleep at the wheel, uh, runs into a tree and just fine, okay? But still, uh, you're wanting to think about the physics of that. Well, you know for a fact that the, initially the car had some kinetic energy and after it ran into a tree, it came to a stop. Clearly some energy was lost. You can't use either of those two top two equations, right? Because basically kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to zero initially, okay? Uh, because in the initial part, it actually had a kinetic energy that was greater than zero and it had a potential energy. If it's running on level ground, uh, that was uh, probably just zero, but if it actually was going uphill, it decreased its uh, uh, potential energy. If it's going downhill, it increased it, uh, or excuse me, vice versa. Uh, so this uh, top equation doesn't work at all. But you know, for instance, I heard a sound. Well, sound takes sound waves, and sound waves take energy to make. So some of the energy went into making sound. Uh, you could touch the metal, and you'd find that the metal got kind of hot from being all crinkly like that. So, yeah, clearly some of the energy went into crinkling the metal and to heating it up. So all those different ways you can think of energy uh, being transferred from the vehicle to other things. For instance, the tree is going to heat up. The tree is going to be pushed over a little bit. That could be worked out, the tree being pushed over. That, that's required, uh, that requires a force applied over a distance to make the tree go from straight up and down or nearly straight up and down to tilted like that. So with this scenario, you can say, okay, well, uh, the car had initial potential energy, so UI is not zero. It had initial kinetic energy, so KI is not zero. Uh, it actually was on the way going downhill. So I might call the very bottom of the hill U final equals zero, in which case I could take the U final and set it equal to zero. But K final is going to turn to zero as well. So if that's the case, where did the rest of that go? Well, the rest of it went into... Uh, the work done in moving that tree, uh, let's say the energy loss in crumpling the metal, the energy loss in uh, making sound, the energy loss in heating up the metal, all those different things. There's also probably the, if the person woke up just before hitting the tree, they probably hit the brakes and the tires will skid. Friction will actually leave a, a skid mark on the road and that's work done against friction, which is another form of E-loss. So when you're looking at these problems, what you want to do is think of all those mechanisms where energy can go and make sure you have exactly one term for each of that, each of those. OK, so you might have work in one, work in two, work in three. Imagine, for instance, uh, you're on a field trip uh, with a bunch of little kids and the school bus gets stuck and for some reason, the person, the school bus driver or someone in the school bus decides, hey, we're going to push the school bus. Well, you'd have a work in due to the instructor pushing it. You'd have a work in due to, due to little Charlie pushing it, a work in due to little Shawnee pushing in, uh, pushing it, a work in due to little Johnny, uh, and so on and so forth. You'd literally have a work in for each of the students pushing it with some force over some distance. You'd also have a work out, for instance, if you uh, if the truck or the bus was actually parked against the tree, you'd actually have to sort of bend the tree limb out of the way to push it. So that would be work done out. Uh, you could lose some energy, uh, but that's not an easy one to fit it on. So let's just start from there. And you see, I've got now all these extra terms I can add. 
so that's the way I treat conservation of energy uh, in my class is I treat it like this one equation, but I recognize that I can have other work ends. I could have E ends too. I could write E gain there if I wanted. And the main thing is when you look at this, you want this side, everything's going to be positive. The only exception being what we're going to find in a second, but everything's going to be positive and it's going to be uh, uh, things that increase speed. Are increase distance. In other words, remember I told you that potential energy was an energy of position. So things that increase the di distance are things that go on the left-hand side. Similarly, the other side, all these terms are supposed to be positive, again, ex except for one exception. And these things tend to decrease speed or decrease distance. So you get closer to the center of the earth, for instance, that'd be a decrease in potential energy. Uh, so that's the kind of things you add on that side. Now, the only case uh, that is not positive is it turns out the gravitational potential energy as a function of position, where R is really big, turns out to be negative G M M over R. So that that's by uh, itself is automatically zero uh, on both sides, but that's the only thing that's ever going to be zero. Any questions on that? I know we haven't applied it to anything yet, but I just want to let you uh, ask any questions if you don't understand some of the terms I've said or anything like that. So again, you could add things over here if you want. You could add other forms of E loss. You could add other forms of E gain. All those things are there just Again, you want to include all these sources exactly once. If you do them twice, you're going to run into a problem. Uh, unless you, you know, you know, one side it's being added to, but the same sort of thing is happening on the other side that's being taken away from. Then you might have two instances of the same sort of thing. So let me apply this equation on a very simple scenario. So my simple scenario is I'm going to have a sled with a kid. And a father is going to be pushing at 100 newtons at 37 degrees above the hor or below the horizontal, I should say. Okay. And they're going to push for a distance of 3.00 meters. And then at the end of that 3.00 meters, the kid's going to go down a really high hill. Okay. And that height from here to here is 300 meters, okay? And I want to know what is the speed at the bottom. Okay, so my connect my conservation of energy thing is work in plus U initial plus kinetic energy initial is equal to work out plus U final plus kinetic energy final plus E loss. In this case, uh, the initial kinetic energy, I'm saying the father pushed the child from start, so that's going to be zero. Uh, I'm going to call the bottom the zero of height, so the final potential energy is going to be zero. I'm going to assume there's no friction, so there's no E loss. I'm going to assume there's no springs being compressed or anything like that, so all that's zero. So in this case, I just get work in plus U initial uh, equals one half mv final squared. Now the free body diagram here will tell us something. 
And I don't necessarily have to do it. The child, I'm going to say, has a mass of the child plus uh, plus the hold on a second. Uh, the mass of the child plus the sled, okay, is going to be 75.0 kilograms. So I have 75.0 kilograms here. And what I have acting is a force. I wrote that 75 kilograms in the worst possible place. Whoa. What I have acting here is a force of 100.0 newtons at 37 degrees, which you guys have learned now that 37 degrees is an indicator that it is a three, four, five triangle. And I didn't draw it big enough, so. So what that means is I'm going to have a force downward of 100 times the sine of 37, which I think you'll realize uh, since 100 is 5 times 20, then this is going to have to be 3 times 20 or 60.0 newtons. And then this one's going to have to be four times 20, which is 80.0 newtons. Okay. So the work in is, in fact, going to be here's the solution. I'll write the solution in green. The work in is going to be 80.0 newtons times a distance of three meters times the cosine of zero degrees. Now I could have, in this case, I could have actually did a 100 Newtons cosine 37 degrees uh, and, and that would have been fine as well. It would have got me the 80 Newtons, but this is, this is good enough. Now I also have plus 75, I'm gonna leave the unit cell because I'm running out of space here, times 9.80 times 300 is equal to one half of 75 times V final squared. So eight times 80 times three is 240. So I got 240.0 Newtons. Uh, 75 times 300 is not easy to do. So I'm gonna use my calculator. 75 times 9.8 times 300. That's uh, that's two hundred and twenty thousand five hundred. So two hundred and twenty thousand five hundred, uh, and that's not newtons. I don't know why I wrote newtons there. Let's fix that real quick. That's joules, <laughs> and this is joules as well. And this is equal to 75 times 9.8, which is 735. Oh, 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 no, it's 75, sorry. I shrunk the screen, but, and then didn't get back at it like I was supposed to. So this is one half times 75, which would be 35, 37.5. And that's actually going to be a joule second squared per meter squared times the final squared. So if I add my 20, 220,500 to my 240, I get 220,740 joules divided by 300, or excuse me, no, 37.5, sorry, divided by 37.5 joules second squared per meter squared is equal to V final squared. So V final is going to turn out to be
And then I take the square root of this answer. And that gives me 76.72 meters per second. So that's the velocity the child will have at the bottom of the slopes, which, by the way, is a little fast. OK, so if we want to, I can reimagine this and solve another problem making more turns. It just I ran out of, uh, I ran out of uh, space on the actual page. So I'm going to go to the next page and do that. It, does anybody have any questions on what I did there? OK. So now let's look at the same problem again, only now I'm going to say the hills right here drops down like this, and then it goes over here. And this has become a Christmas vacation moment. So this right here is going to be, let's say, uh, 300.0 meters, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is equal to 0 0.200. And then it's going to run into a spring-loaded bumper that I will recognize as a board with a spring on it. And the K for that spring is going to be uh, 10 to the fifth newtons per meter. That's the spring constant. Again, we still start off with the same scenario where the kid is being pushed by the dad. One hundred Newton force at thirty seven. Dang it. Below horizontal. for 3.00 meters, okay? And the same height, of course, it's still 300 meters. Okay, and what I want to do is uh, I want to figure out, uh, let's say first, how fast it'll be going at the end of the, Road. So if you remember in the part on Christmas, uh, Christmas vacation, uh, Griswold was on his toboggan at the top of the mountain. Of course, he didn't have anybody pushing him in, but he had sprayed it with that super smooth, uh, frictionless spray, cooking spray, and it made it shoot really, really fast down the hill. And then he ran across a road and across a parking lot. So that's sort of what I'm representing here. And then, of course, he ran into, I think it was an outhouse or something. Uh, but we're sort of doing that. So I want to know what the velocity is right here. And I'm calling that V final two. And if that is greater than zero, then he's obviously going to run into the spring. And then I want to know how far he's going to compress the spring. OK, so that's the two parts I'm solving for. So again, I'm going to use, I'll use a blue solution this time. So work in plus U initial plus K initial is equal to work out plus U final plus K final plus E loss. And now this is a little better because I can now see a little bit of everything going on. So first off, let's find out what V final two is equal to. So what I'm going to put in is just like I had before, 80.0 newtons times 3.00 meters times cosine of zero degrees plus 75 times 9.8 times 300. Again, I'm leaving off the units now, plus zero. So this one's zero. Uh, this one's going to be zero. And uh, for this first part, where I'm just going across the uh, rough pavement, I'm going to assume that there's no work done. But there's going to be some e-loss. 
And that's what I'm calling the, the work done against friction. So that's going to be equal to one half mv final two squared plus now the friction force is going to be mu kinetic times the normal force times uh, the distance x, or actually we'll call it the distance d. Okay, so I can calculate this stuff again. This is still 240. Uh, plus 220,500 joules, joules is equal to uh, 37.5 times V final squared. Now, in this part, part it's going to be 0 0.200. The normal force is just going to be the weight, so that's 75 times 9.8. Uh, times the distance, which is 300 meters, and we'll see what happens. Now, if this uh, if this right hand side exceeds the left hand side, then that means the object came to a rest on the pavement or the parking lot or whatever the crap that is. All right. So now I'm going to say this is two two zero seven four zero joules minus. Uh, let's see what point two times seventy five times all that stuff is. So I'm going to say 0 0.2 times 75 times 9.8 times 300. That gives me 441,000. So yes, that's way too big. Joules plus 37.5 VF squared. So this implies it will stop on rough patch. So because of that, what we can do is now we'll have to regroup and say the final velocity is going to be zero. So now I'm going to say two, two, zero, seven, four, zero joules is equal to uh, zero kinetic energy plus 0 0.200 times 75 times 9.8, again, assuming level ground here, times x. So now we're going to figure out what x is. And I'm calling this actually uh, x are for on the rough spot. So basically, we're just going to tell us how far we're going to go from here to here. That's going to be XR. Okay. So with that being in mind, we got 220740. Uh, that's going to be uh, divided by parenthesis 0 0.2 times 75 times 9.8. And that gives me 1,501.63. So we've got some kind of inconsistency here because there's no way that comes out that way. Point two times 75. Because this is suggesting it went 1,501 meters. I said it was only 300 meters. Did I make a... Ah, I see why. Did anybody, is anybody working along with me? I misread this. So ignore and go down to here. So what we had is 220740 joules is actually equal to 44,100 joules plus 37.5 V final two squared. So that V final two is actually equal to 220740 minus 44,100 
So that's going to be 176,640 divided by 37.5. And now I'm going to take the square root of that. And that's going to give me 68.63 meters per second. So I was wrong. It didn't make it, it did make it all the way across there. I was afraid because I had made up new numbers last time. I think I did the number, the distance of the rough spots was 100 meters. So I thought maybe I underestimated it uh, and made it too small uh, or too big. So anyways, that's what the velocity is when it leaves that thing. So now we can go back and figure out what the X is. In other words, how much is it going to compress? Because what's happening here is uh, basically all the kinetic energy is going to be converted to potential energy of the spring. Now I could again set it equal to the 220740 uh equal to uh, zero final velocity, so, so zero kinetic energy, plus the one half K times X squared. And that would all work out. But what I've just discovered is what the kinetic energy is just before it hits it. So I could also just set the kinetic energy equal to one half K X squared, and that would work it as well. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say now X equals question mark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that 220740 joules, remember that's the work in plus the initial potential energy, that's going to be equal to the E loss, which is uh, 0 0.2 times 75 times 9.8 times 300 and then plus one half of kx squared and k is 10 to the fifth times x squared and that's going to give us x and I'm going to compute that real quick so I said 220740 minus 44,100, that's the amount for the potential energy or for the uh, E loss due to friction. And now I'm going to multiply that number, that subtraction that I just got, I'm going to multiply that by two and divide it by 10 to the fifth. So I'll say times two. And I'm divide it by one exponent five. And then I'm going to take the square root of all that junk, which actually is not too bad. Uh, the square root of that answer, which by the way, the answer was 3.53. So I'm taking the square root of 3.53. So the X that it's going to compress the box is one point, or excuse me, the spring is 1.88 meters, even though that force is huge now. Remember that force is uh, 100,000 newtons per meter, and I'm still gonna basically get it uh, 1.88 meters. So that's, yeah, that's a lot of force that's going into that. Anybody have any questions on that? So that's a nice use of conservation of energy techniques, which really I'm going beyond conservation of energy. Remember, conservation of energy is really just dealing with the potential energies and kinetic energies. Uh, I just showed you a way to deal with non-conservative forces, and I need to show you a little bit about what non-conservative forces are, what's that mean, okay? So I've, I've sort of hinted to it in the past. Does anybody have any questions on this before I move on to the next neat topic? Okay, so one more thing before I get into that special law stuff. Uh, power is often defined as dW dt 
or DEDT. The main thing is, it's the amount of, of work done or energy made or energy absorbed per time. And instantaneously, that means a derivative, but you could also have average power is equal to delta W over delta T, even though delta W doesn't really make much sense, but you could say delta E over delta T. Uh, remember, W is not a state variable, so you can't say I'm at this much work. Uh, you can, but it's not physically meaningful. So if we think about this and we say DW is equal to F dot DL, then we might say P is equal to D by DT of F dot DL. Now, if the force is actually constant, then this will just become, and that's a T down here, not an X. Right? This will just become F dotted with DL DT. What do you guys think DLDT is? Anyone? It's velocity. So in fact, power can be represented as force times velocity, and it's a dot product because Power is a scalar. Uh, power, by the way, has units of joules per second, which is defined to be a watt. Okay. And uh, that's basically what power is. So if you know what force is required for a car to maintain its velocity at, say, 60 miles per hour due to wind resistance, and, and tire friction, it's got to apply a force uh, constantly to the ground to keep it moving at a velocity of V. You can just take the magnitude of that velocity, since uh, the magnitude of that force, since it's parallel to the velocity, and multiply it by the velocity, of course, using meters per second, not miles per hour, and that will actually give you the power of it. And it turns out the power of it, uh, it measured in watts, can be related to what we know of as horsepower. And I think it's like, uh, I think it's like uh, one horsepower is 745 joules or something like that. Uh, let's see if I can look that up real quick for you guys. Horsepower, there it is. 746, yeah, 74.7. So uh, one horsepower. So you talk about horsepower of your engine, horsepower of a boat engine, so on and so forth, is actually equal to 745.7 watts, okay? So that's a useful number that comes in handy every now and then, but it's basically, you can work it out by, you know, connecting to a bunch of horses, let them work, uh, maybe lifting a mass a certain distance, or maybe pulling a plow with a certain force over a certain distance, say let them do that for five or six hours straight or eight hours straight then take the total amount of work done divided by the eight or the six hours that you use and that'll give you a, a certain number of watts and you could uh, define that to be the horsepower and when they did something like that they found that a horsepower is about 745.7 watts okay and when you're talking about your power company uh, the power company bills you in kilowatt hours. So that's written kilowatt times hours. So that turns out to be uh, 10 to the third watts times one hour is 3,600 seconds. So you can see it's 3.6 times 10 to the sixth. Uh, and remember a watt is a joule per second, so it's joules. So you see the power company doesn't sell you power, they sell you energy. So there's some neat units that will come in handy. Uh, anyways, anybody have any questions on that? So, I mean, normally they'll have you calculate some amount of work and you divide it by the time taken and that'll give you the power. And that's pretty much all you use is very simple, straightforward problems. But what I wanted to talk to you about is a, a bigger thing that exists. So I'm gonna take a whole other page on this. It turns out that there's this mathematical thing that you can prove 
And what it says is this, if one of these things are true, then all of them are true. So if one is true, then all are true. So let's imagine you have a force F, it's a vector. Well, if you do something called the curl of F, which is defined to be this vector operator cross-producted with F, if that is identically zero, then, so that's one, then F is a conservative force. Again, this has nothing to do with Reagan or Carter. I think I wrote Ford here, didn't I? This means conservative, meaning, meaning that you can make up a conservation law for it. Okay. Now, sidebar, what is that curl thing? Well, it turns out there's an operator called del or nabla. That's the Portuguese for it, is nabla. <laughs> and that is, in fact, a vector operator that has an I hat followed by a partial with respect to X, a J hat followed with a partial with respect to Y, and a K hat followed with a partial with respect to K. And if you put a scalar next to it, then that derivative will act on, each derivative will act on the scalar and the answer to that uh, that derivative will actually be set next to i hat, and then for the derivative with respect to y, that will be set next to j hat, and the derivative with respect to k, uh, with respect to z will be set next to k hat, and then they will all be added together to make a vector. Okay. Well, the del cross f, and there is another one called the divergence, which is a dot product instead of a cross product. This is actually equal to the determinant of a matrix. That matrix has a I hat, J hat, and a K hat as the top row. It has a partial with respect to X, partial with respect to Y, and partial with respect to Z as the middle row. And it has the X component of F as the bottom row with F component of Y and the F component of the Z component of F there. That's what that curl is. And if that is identically zero, meaning it comes out to zero no matter what the X, Y, and Z are, then it's a conservative force, okay? So that's the math that's behind all that stuff. Uh, you're going to deal with it a little bit next semester, not hardly at all this semester, okay? Now, again, if one of these is true, all are true. So, so the next bit will be three. The line integral from a to b of f dot dl is just going to be equal to some uh, u of b minus u of a. In other words, it's independent of path. That's why so many people can get through this class doing line integrals uh, without knowing their line integrals because it really does it's really hard to screw one up. Uh, but that's really what's going on here. So you can go from A to B. You can go by this route. 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 And they all give you the same answer. Number four, which I think you can see follows straight from this, the closed integral of f dot dl is equal to zero. And what we mean by closed integral is you're starting at a, and then you're going in some closed loop. 
In other words, you're starting and stopping at the same position. So it turns out that's always going to be equal to zero. And then there's a part five. And I'm going to use some mathematical terms here. Uh, so here's one. Upside down, backwards, E. There exists a scalar function u. Here's another mathematical term that looks like the front edge of a cursive s followed by a t, and that means such that f is equal to the negative gradient of u. Okay, and uh, f equals negative gradient of u means negative number partial of f with respect to x times i hat plus partial of f with respect to y times j hat plus the partial of f with respect to z times k hat. And that actually, of course, makes a vector. If you want to think about what that gradient is, if you look at a topological map and you see, you know, all those little circles and weird shapes, they're actually all one continuous line is all the exact same height. Well, if you find uh, the place where all the lines are closest to each other and you draw a line perpendicular to, I mean, uh, basically connecting those points together, that route will be your quickest way down. OK, well, that happens to be the gradient. And that's its direction. In other words, the largest of those would actually be that direction. So that's another way of thinking about it. There's actually another bit that comes from this. Uh, you could say, for instance, uh, DF is equal to the partial of F with respect to X DX plus the partial of F with respect to Y DY. OK. That is a form of differential equation uh, called an exact differential equation. And if you've had differential equations, though, now you'll know sometimes you'll have something like this equal to zero. And the first thing you do is you take the function in front of the dx and you take the derivative of it with respect to y. And then you take the function that's in front of the dy, you take the derivative of it with respect to x. And if those two are equal, it's called an exact differential equation. Uh, and you go through a process to actually solve it. That's basically another corollary to this. So all these things are related. And that's why we have a potential energy function for gravity. That's MGY. And the other one, of course, is our MGZ, I should say. And the other one, of course, is negative GMM over R. Notice if you take, since U equals MGZ, that's only a function of Z. If you take the derivative of MGZ with respect to Z, what do you get? The derivative of MG times Z with respect to Z, what do you get? Wouldn't it just be MG? Exactly. Now you got to multiply it by a negative according to this formula. Right here. So you get negative MG, right? And then according to this formula, right here, that's going to actually be multiplied by k hat. So you're going to get that the force is negative mg k hat, which is exactly the force of gravity that we found. So that's the deeper meaning of all of this. And that's enough. You guys are, of course, free to go. I'll wait for the last person to leave in case you have any questions. Uh, but you are free to go. Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Joseph, Alvin, Bianca, anybody? All right. Well, you're free to chat, too, in case your speaker is not working. Let me stop sharing for a second so I can see any chats y'all might be pulling up on me. 
I don't see any. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for actually uh, keeping up with that calculation for me. I uh, wish I would have saw that earlier. It would have helped me a bit. <laughs> Anybody? You stole my gig, Miana. <laughs> All right, I'm going to call it. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye.